Welcome to the New Abbey YouTube channel. We are a Jesus community telling the biggest story of God in Los Angeles, and we're excited that you're joining the conversation with us today. Enjoy. With that, we are all about conversation. Uh, we believe that God has something to say through each and every one of us, that God is not just speaking through the people who are on stage, uh, but that God speaks to the entire life of our community. And so that's why we jump into conversation every week. Uh, you can click on conversation time in, your, in the links, or they will put a link up for you to get into some Zoom groups. We'll break you out and we'll be answering this question with one another. What are you most proud of overcoming? It's fascinating to think about how much reality has changed over the last year, how much of the history or the world that we know has been rewritten because of the COVID virus. My wife and I were at a park the other day and we were listening to these three women have a conversation. And if you were to close your eyes and listen to this conversation and COVID haven't, hadn't happened, you would have thought you lived in a very different reality. But in the last year, a lot of things have changed for us. And these three women were sitting down and they began to say, do you think it's okay if we take it off? I feel just so like bad or naughty if we take it off here. In fact, I, I even put on lipstick just in case we, we had to take them off. And I know what they were talking about because I live in 2021. But if that conversation was two years ago, it would have been something very different. And they were having this dialogue back and forth about how uncomfortable they felt taking off their masks in public. And they, even at one point, they're just saying to themselves like, I don't know if, I, if I'm allowed to take it off in public like this. And that reality itself has changed. It was one of these just hilarious comedic moments where I thought to myself, if this had happened at any other time, I would just be bursting out loud or I would immediately be turning to look at what the heck are these people talking about in the middle of a park. But immediately I knew. They're terrified like everyone else of, is this kosher or not kosher? Am I allowed to wear this thing or should I not wear this thing? Or what's the real science around it or not around it? And what's all of the angst that all of us are dealing with as we live into a different reality? That history as we know it is being rewritten in some way and we're still figuring out what it's gonna mean for the actual way that we live our lives. We've been in this series in Genesis and we're like 10 whole verses in and like six weeks in. So we're going to finish this thing by 2023. Let's go. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. But the power of the story of Genesis is it's all about a story of a journey. It's a story of multiple layers of journeys happening at once. It's not just a story of the matriarchs and the patriarchs and their journey through the book of Genesis. It's also a story about the people of God at different seasons within different centuries and different millennia who actually wrote these stories down for a purpose and for a reason so that they could understand their lives and their humanity and who God is and how their faith actually works. It's a story of a journey for us in 2021 that the Bible, that the scriptures may actually still have something to say for us that impacts the reality and the history that we live into. And so today we'll be in Genesis 12 once again, but we're talking about the idea of rewriting our story and the power of rewriting our own story. And to do that, we gotta talk about some things. We're gonna talk about Genesis to Babylon on a Sunday morning. Then we're gonna talk about what is actually recorded history. And if we can do that, then we can talk about the subjective and objective reality that we all live into every day. Then we're gonna get a little bit deeper and get a Venn diagram out and talk about the intersubjective reality and everybody said, amen. Then if we can do that, we're gonna talk about rewriting history. And if we can actually rewrite history, we can ask ourselves some bigger questions like, does it actually work? Can we critique ourselves? What would that look like to get out of the box? Then we can travel light on a Sunday morning into our lives. So if you have your old school Bibles like me or an iPhone or the internet, or you just want to read from the screen, turn to Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. 
Say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. Man, some real leadership there. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants and maidservants and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram, what have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. And then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Eric did a really good job of talking about this story last week, really from the perspective of Abraham and ourselves and the betrayal that we all go through as individuals. I want to look at this story one more time, but I want to pan out a little bit to understand it in a deeper way. You may have seen me do this over the last couple weeks, but when we think about the Genesis stories, I want to help us have a bigger lens of really how we understand the Bible so that we can better understand how to the the reality of our own lives. That when we look at the Bible, what we are often trained to think of is that these are literal stories and that this is somehow recorded history. And that like most books, you go from beginning to end and you read it in some linear or chronological order. Spoiler alert, that is not a helpful way to read the Bible. The Bible is put together in different ways. The Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible is put together really in an order of importance. It's all about what provides the most meaning for the people of God. It is not chronological. And even when it was written down, it's not chronological. The value of the stories are placed to tell a bigger story about the liberation of who Yahweh is and how this God Yahweh liberates God's people and the blessing of what that actually means. And that leads to the Jesus story and other things later on. But a lot of times we just don't understand how to read the Bible well, and that gets in the way of us actually experiencing it. So what I want to try on with you, and many of you have done already so much work in in deconstructing and reconstructing, is take the Bible seriously and don't take it literally. Don't take it literally right now because that's actually not what's going on in this story. And we're gonna take and look at it from a little bit bigger picture. That the Genesis story, whenever that was, was some time in history long ago. There's some important dates for you to think about. So uh, around the year zero, of course, that's Jesus. Uh, About 500 years before that is something called the Babylonian captivity. About 500 years before that would be like King David and Solomon. About 500 years before that, the people of God would be in Egypt, and sometime before that would be Abraham. So 3,500 years ago-ish, but we're taking the story seriously and not literally, which for some of you, this may be scary. You maybe even tried something like this on before, that what I'm saying is that the Abraham stories are more of mythology. They're telling a deeper truth for the people of God versus the need for them to be historical recorded events which is not how the ancient world would have understood God, understood writings, understood scriptures. Here's some other important details to think about. For most of history, people did not read and write. So most of the stories that were handed down were handed through an oral tradition. So when we get to about 500 BCE or about 500 years before Jesus, the people of God, the Israelites are in Babylon. They are in this place of captivity. Almost the entire Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament is written down in between the period of the Babylonian captivity and Jesus. And here's why. You don't need to write down your stories when your experience of God is a sacrificial system. So you don't need scriptures. You are experiencing God through aroma and touch and feel and visually seeing something. You are bringing a part of your livelihood, an animal or crop that you may have, and you are bringing it to a priest and you're experiencing God through your senses in a different way. And your understanding of God happens through an oral tradition. So you you hear these stories of God because you cannot read and you cannot write. And unfortunately, Steve Jobs has not created the iPad yet. 
So you must sit around a fire late at night and hear about your stories from grandma and grandpa. And the people of God would begin to tell these stories in a different way when they were no longer in the land. There was such a time for the people of Israel where they understood themselves because they lived in the land that they believed that God had promised to them. And now they were no longer there. They were immigrants. They were aliens. They were foreigners in another place. They didn't have a home to call their own. And even more than that, the place that they used to worship God, which was the temple, where they would bring their sacrifices, where they would experience with their senses this connection and relationship to, with God was now destroyed. Imagine for a little bit how disorienting that would be, how disorienting it would be to question your faith, to deconstruct some things, to wonder if what the priests were saying or your youth pastor were actually true, to wonder, could God meet you here in this foreign land, in this wilderness, in this desert where you doubted and questioned all of what you've been going through? Does this sound familiar? And that you needed to pivot in your relationship or your understanding with who you are as a human being because you need to re-understand or rewrite a new history of who God is and how you engage with God in the world. And so for the first time, there's all of these people in a different place and they begin to write down the stories of the Bible because they want to understand the relationship with God in a fresh way. And here's the power of that. They now can take these stories with them wherever they go. That they don't have to go to just one place anymore to experience God. That they can experience God in their homes, in different villages, in different cities. And this is where the synagogue was created. Where Judaism in the ancient world, by the way, let me just pause. If you're like, man, this guy is boring me on a Sunday morning talking about ancient Babylonian captivity and we're getting into Judaism and the development of the synagogue. You're right, I am. You're welcome. I promise you we're going somewhere with this. And so Judaism was really created in this period of time. It was the creation of spirituality and the end of religion. These were one of the first moments in all of history that when your God was defeated, your God was taken away, everything that you understood about God was gone, a entire people group pivoted, evolved, reconstructed, reclaimed, built something new to, so that they could still experience their God. What a powerful moment in history where they said, what if God is not to be experienced just in the external temples of this world? What if I don't have to show up to a Bethel concert just to experience God? Well, I know. What if I experience God through my own internal journey? That is the gift that is happening in the world at this time. And then the scriptures begin to be written down. And this is where we get this story in Genesis 12. First of all, it's a weird story. Let's just name that. Abram, the father of three of the monotheistic faiths on planet Earth, by the way, is pimping out his wife. I grew up in a church world where we would try to clean this story up. Well, you see that Abraham was subtly pimping out Sarai because the ends would justify the means. And as long as we blah, 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 blah. No, it's a weird story. And it's not a story about Abram. That's why it's a weird story. It's a story about people stuck in Babylon a thousand years later trying to understand their relationship to God and to their land. And so what do they tell? They tell a story about Abram that sounds a lot like the other stories of the Bible. Remember the story of Joseph. Joseph went to a foreign land, to Egypt, and God blessed Joseph and the people of God there. It's the story of Exodus. Oh, the people of God won't be in the promised land one day. There'll be another oppressive ruler who is right um, watching over them, but God will still come to their rescue. So they tell all of these stories about being in a foreign land, being oppressed, but that God comes to their rescue. They write these stories down later to give themselves hope for that present moment. That's what's going on. So for the modern reader, we say, this is a weird ass story in the Bible because it is. But for people in Babylon, you're retelling stories that give you hope. And the hope is God can be with you even when you're in foreign lands. 
God can be with you even when you're in captivity. Let's make this more practical for our lives. God can be with you even when you're experiencing oppression. God can be with you even when you're in places of wilderness. God can be with you even when you're living in doubt. God can be with you even when you're in deconstruction. God can be with you even when you don't think that a God lives in this place. This God will still show up. That's when you need that story. This is why the story is so powerful. We don't need recorded history. We need history that speaks to the reality of what it means to be human. And that's what the Bible is offering us here. This was not a story about Abram. This was a story about a people of God who were stuck in captivity and they were trying to understand what life with God could actually look like. What many of us want as we experience any event in our lives is that we want to believe that we're experiencing an event through an objective reality. And we believe that because all of us are the centers of our own universe. Congrats. And because of that, we all believe that our experience is the most important experience. You're not evil for that. You're not bad for that. You're not insidious for that. You're just a human being. The only movie that's going on in your head is your movie. And so you have you ever had this moment where you're thinking about like, I wonder what all those people are thinking about me or saying about me. They're not. They're thinking about themselves. So don't worry about it because they're a human being as well. And so in the world, we have subjective realities and objective realities. A subjective reality is something like this. It's raining outside. I feel sad today because it's raining. And rainy days and clouds make me feel bad about myself or whatever. That's a subjective reality because there's another person who experiences rain. They're like, it is raining today. And it's like Frankie probably like, the glories of God are being washed down upon us. Praise you, lamb, for your good gifts. It's a subjective reality. Nobody gets to tell you if the rain is good or the rain is bad. It's just rain. Then there's an objective reality. An objective reality is gravity. If I drop this Bible, it falls to the ground. Doesn't matter if I believe it's going to or not, gravity does what gravity's going to do. That's objective reality. Most of us confuse the two. If you've ever been in a relationship, or had an argument with somebody, well, you know that I said, or when I did this, or why can't you just see it my way? We all believe that we are describing an event from our objective standpoint, and that we are the ones that are correct. You're not. You both are having subjective realities, and you're both correct. Have fun in dating and married relationships. It's the joy of it. It's the joy of figuring out our subjective realities and where we're at. Now, let's talk about something even bigger than that, something more powerful that is unique to human beings. In fact, we know that um, mammals, other mammals, you never saw me going here, did you, experience objective realities and emotions, but they experience objective realities around uh, emotionally experiencing something because they're hungry or because they want to survive. Human beings experience greater realities in different ways because of our capacity to tell stories, because of our capacity for imagination. A, a cat or a chimpanzee is not creating a story about a banana. They're just experiencing an emotion because there's a banana in front of them and they're hungry, right? Human beings, we have the capacity to tell bigger stories. And this is what we call intersubjective realities. Never thought you'd hear about this on a Sunday morning, so here we go. <laughs> intersubjective realities is our ability for storytelling. Here's an example of a great intersubjective reality capitalism, or money. Intersubjective realities are stories that we all agree upon. They are subjective. They are not real, but we all agree upon them, and so they work, and this is what creates reality. I use this one all of the time. It's like when the college student comes to me and says, money is just a concept, and it's not real. Uh, you're right, it is just a concept and not real, but try to pay your rent with hugs doesn't work because it's an intersubjective reality that we've agreed to. We now live in a world that when I go to Vons and I buy some bread, I don't get out seashells or say, can I give you some grain for this? No, we've agreed on that there's money that we exchange and there's a value system to it. Is it objectively real like gravity? It's not, but it's real because we all agree to the rules of it. And so because we all agree to the rules of it, it forces and shifts and creates reality in a different 
way. In a family system, we have intersubjective realities that we agree to the rules of a family. Maybe you live in a family where you, you never dishonor your family's name. Is that true like gravity? It's not, but it's a mode of operation or a compass that keeps you grounded in the world. That many of us live in the United States of America where there's this language of uh, like the manifest destiny of the United States or America's greatness or the belief in democracy is an intersubjective reality. The belief in democracy worked better than having a monarchy, right? And so we agree to a new reality and because we all agree to it, it works. And here's where things get scary. Like the insurrection that happened at the Capitol last month. It becomes incredibly terrifying when people begin to believe in a different intersubjective reality that, in this case, pun intended, trumps the previous one. And because they do that and they believe in that, they may do really horrific things. So what was scary about the insurrection is that you had people who believed in Trump or MAGA over the reality of the democracy of the United States of America. Was it objectively true? Was it subjectively true? It was intersubjectively true because enough people agreed on it that they were willing to storm the US Capitol. This happens all of the time in the world. And now let's bring that back to our conversation today. For the people of God in Babylon, they begin to write down the book of Genesis because they needed a new intersubjective reality for themselves. The previous reality that they agreed to was no longer working for them. They no longer had the land. They no longer had a temple. Their understanding and way of life in which they had relationship with God was completely gone. And so they had to form a new reality in which they could agree to. And in this new reality, that this reality was that God could go with you wherever because the scriptures could go with you wherever you were. It was the beginning of spirituality. Jesus will play on this later. And this is really the power of the, the Holy Spirit. It's this realization of you'll never need a temple. In fact, you don't even need the scriptures. You are already the temple of God. That's the beauty of it. The scriptures are here just to remind you of that. It, the scriptures in and of themselves are not more important than you. You are a human being. You're the most important thing. This is the evolution of our understanding and relationship with God that takes place. And so for the people of God, they're asking themselves the same questions that, we were all, that we've always asked. Is God still for me? Is God still here? Everything has been lost. Everything that I once believed in, I now doubt. And in this story, in this version of it, in the writing down of the scriptures, it was saying, ah, we need to write down these Abraham stories so that there's some hope that reminds us of even our, our earliest mothers and fathers. They were in the same place as us. They doubted, they wondered, they questioned, they were scared. They were aliens and immigrants in foreign lands. They were in the wilderness and guess what? They got through it. And we're gonna keep telling future generations that story so that we have hope to keep moving forward in this reality. And when we all agree upon this together, that's the power of it. When people say things like, I don't need community or I don't need church, it's not true. You need other people around you who agree to a larger reality and story. And together you walk in that thing and that's how the world is actually transformed. And we all need to rewrite those stories in a way, but we need to rewrite the stories of God in ways that actually work for our lives. So as we rewrite history, just like the people of God did, by the way, in, in the Babylonian captivity. That's how the scriptures came together. People were rewriting history, a subjective history, so that it would work for their actual lives. How powerful is that? For some people, that's terrifying. Corey, that's a slippery slope, and people are gonna go to hell because of that. They're not, don't worry about it, let's move on. The truth is, we need a larger reality that actually works in 2021. The, many of the belief systems or the practices no longer work for our actual lives. And so I wanna leave with a couple things to think about. Does it work? Does the history that you're writing for your life right now actually work? Can you experience God in a meaningful way in 2021 in a place like Los Angeles or wherever you're at? If you're still holding on to other people's, right? Uh, intersubjective realities about the rapture or hell, or Calvinism, or some belief system that oppresses or suppresses other human beings, you can let it go. And then when people say to you, how can you let that go? You say, because I'm just following how the Bible was written. Truly, 
I'm just following the people of faith. We've always created a bigger, more robust faith that actually works for our lives. We need our faith to be able to travel with us. Does it work for you? So if you are deconstructing, praise God, you're taking your faith seriously. You're taking it seriously to ask bigger questions and now keep doing the work towards maturity and reconstruct and reclaim some new things in your life. Not only do you need to ask, how does it work? But you're asking these other bigger questions that are taking place in the scriptures. Are you willing to critique yourself? One of the powerful things about the Jewish and Christian scriptures is that they critique themselves. They have to write these stories down later in Babylon because they were unfaithful. And so some of these stories are reminders of, you wanna know why we were aliens and foreigners in other lands? Because we didn't participate in covenant. And it's one of the only faiths on planet Earth that is willing to critique itself in that way. Think about this. You write your holy scriptures and the things that you write down are critiques of the things that you've done. You would think that you would just write, and wherever we go, God made us richer. No. You say that there were times that we weren't participating in covenant, and those are the moments that we grew and had to rethink and pivot and grow. But you know that's true in your own life. I know from my own story and the history that I want to rewrite is this year I'm going to be married 15 years. Let's go. This baby face. But in 2008, and many of you have heard my story before, I was unfaithful in my marriage in a lot of different ways. I had had multiple affairs. And I have a choice that I made throughout my entire life since then. My history can be, I ruined it, I blew it, all negative back there. But my wife and I just had this beautiful date weekend and we've talked about our history and how powerful it is. And we say this all the time. We don't wish our wilderness upon anybody, but how it's transformed and changed us, who it shaped us to become, the power of us authentically and vulnerably sharing our story has brought a lot of healing to other people's lives that I rewrite my history because I'm willing to critique myself. I'm willing to offer regret for that. I'm willing to say that wasn't my best life. God loves me in a better way so that I can love myself and others in a better way. That's powerful. That's what the story of Abraham, that's why it's kind of weird, right? Is that God offers us the opportunity to critique ourselves and to have a bigger story of where we're going. So does it work? Does your story work for you? Are you able to critique yourself in your story? And then I think about this. Are you able to get out of the box? The power of the Genesis story being written down is it was written down when the people of God were in Israel. And God was literally in a box for them in the temple. And now all of a sudden, where is God? Maybe as you're deconstructing in this moment in your life, it's not God that's in a box, it's you. It's you who has continued limited stories and beliefs about who God is. Maybe what the scriptures are trying to show you is that there have been people of God for thousands of years who they have gotten out of the box and even God has gotten out of the box sometimes and that God is always willing to evolve, that God has already been ahead of us. It's us who are catching up. It's us who can tell bigger stories and to pivot in different ways. And then finally think about this, that if you can ask these questions about rewriting your own history of is is your life working for you? Am I able to critique my own life so that I can grow and mature and transform in healthy ways? Am I able to deconstruct and get out of the box or let God out of the box so that I can actually flourish? Then maybe the last thing to think about as we rewrite our stories, just like the people in Babylon, can we travel light for where we're going ahead? Can we actually shed some of the pounds and some of the weight that we've been carrying? Because we can always carry those stories of anger and that church over there and that youth pastor said this thing to us. I love when people tell me I hate the church. All two billion of them? No, you hate John for the thing he told you about purity culture when you were 17. That's different. Go deal with that. Don't hate 2 billion people. Travel a little bit lighter. Do some work. Go to a therapist. Join a small group. Get a spiritual director. Let go of some of that baggage. When the people of Babylon left captivity, it wasn't just stories about how bad the Babylonians were. It was an opportunity to grow up and to say, how can we get back to our original stories where God blesses us and we be a blessing to the world? And that's why they wrote them down. That's why we have Genesis 12, is that they're reminding us of what the story was really about that God has always been there for us, even in our different seasons? And then can we remind ourselves of the actual realities and the actual histories that we want to live into? Rewriting your story is up to you. No one else will rewrite your story for you. 
But the power of it is, as you rewrite your story, as you ask bigger questions of how it's actually working for you, as you have the maturity to actually critique yourself, as you're willing to step out of boxes of deconstruction and into new realms of reconstructing and adding things, as you're willing to travel a little bit lighter in life because you've done some healing work, you'll rewrite your story in a powerful way. And as you do that, it allows other people to rewrite their story as well. And in doing so, it allows us to rewrite a story of God that actually heals the world. We're gonna jump back in some groups and answer this question with one another. How can you rewrite a bigger and truer story of your life? Enjoy. Enjoy.